I have opinions about it. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Here is Professor Bill Thierfelder. He's a retired professor of the arts and humanities and a docent at the American Museum of Natural History. He recently took a trip back to New York from his home in Oregon um, to give us a special tour of the new Gilda Center wing. And you could take it away, Professor. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Marie. Yeah, so welcome to... Uh, the Hewlett Woodmere Library's presentation called What's the Buzz? It's the world of insects. We're going to focus on insects, but that's a major part of the new Gilder Center. So I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of both. Um, and as you just heard, I am your host today, Dr. Bill Tierfelder. I'm a retired professor of arts and humanities. I live in Portland, Portland, Oregon. And there here, I'm a lecturer, writer, and artist. And as you also heard, I do make it back to uh, New York on a very regular basis to continue my work at the museum. And I was recently there, beginning of May, for the opening of the Gilda, uh, Gilder Center, the opening weekend, in fact. So lots of fun. Um, okay. So because we can't fit everything into an hour program, um, this is about 60, 65 minutes or so. I invite you to go to my website, makingwings.net, and go to deeper dive number 93. So let me just click on that and we can see that. So you, when you go to makingwings.net, you will be brought to my homepage. Just go to the upper right corner. There's a little hamburger menu is what that's called. And you'll see a whole bunch of deeper dives. For those of you who are new to my presentations, um, for every website, for excuse me, website, for every program that I give you <clears throat> at various libraries, uh, I create on my website a corresponding page. So in this case, it is number 93. What's the buzz? And what that will do is it will take you to <clears throat> this page, which gives you a whole kind of uh, introduction, uh, gives you pictures of the uh, American Museum of Natural History, as well as um, a beautiful architectural review of the new building, some recommended media that we'll be talking about, and then a whole bunch of things about insects themselves, what is an insect, what isn't an insect, and uh, some of the insects that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, and for each one of them, I have a corresponding uh, link to, for example, this is an overview of butterflies. So if you just click on this one, just for example, you'll be brought to the Smithsonian's page about butterflies. But when you're done, all you have to do is X that out and you're brought back immediately to my page so that you can continue your exploration. So hope you take advantage of that, makingwings.net. Deeper dive number 93. Now, let's go back here. Uh, one of the things that you just saw on my website was a section called Recommended Media. Uh, DK Books and the Smithsonian Institution have published two superb handbooks about uh, insects and uh, moths and butterflies. And both of these guides um, uh, are really terrific. Uh, the guide to insects also includes a section uh, on other arthropods, including spiders, which we will discuss in a few minutes uh, because they're not insects at all. <laughs> More about that. Um, I also recommend uh, Extraordinary Insects by Anne Sverdrup Thygeson. Um, it explores the importance of insects to the survival of our planet. And if you want to watch something remarkable, if you prefer visual, I strongly, strongly recommend Life in the Undergrowth. Um, it's a five-part BBC series, uh, dates from 2005, but it's still gorgeous to look at and still uh, very accurate. Um, and it's narrated, of course, by the one and only David Attenborough. Uh, who's still going strong. Um, the first episode in particular is an excellent examination about 
how the first arthropods, including insects, made their first appearance on dry land some 400 million years ago. So what are we going to do today? Well, first, we're going to look at the American Museum of Natural History's Gilder Center, which includes a magnificent insectarium and vivarium. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. Uh, then we're going to explain what an arthropod and an insect is. Then we'll look at a few examples of animals that are not insects, but often called insects, but they're not. And from there, we're going to focus on four different insects, ants, bees, butterflies, and moths. And finally, we'll end with what I like to call seven honorable mention critters. So uh, this should be fun, lots of stuff. So. Let's begin. So here's the entrance to the Richard Gilder Center for Science, Education, and Innovation as seen from Columbus Avenue and 80th Street. Uh, and here's another view of that entrance. One of the problems at the museum was that it was shaped, imagine in your head, shaped like a horseshoe. And what that meant is if that you were on either end of the horseshoe, you had to retrace your steps to go back to other exhibits on the other side of the horseshoe. What the Gilder Center does, it connects those two ends of the horseshoe. So now it's basically a great big, for lack of a better word, a great big square. So now you can make complete loops of the first floor, the second floor, and third and fourth floors. Now, when you enter the building, you're ushered into the Kenneth C. Griffin Exploration Atrium. Now, it's an, a magnificent and imposing space. One of the things that was done very purposely when building this building, and it took about 10 years, it was uh, the first um, plans uh, were uh, executed in 2014, and it just opened now in May of 2023, so almost, almost 10 years. Um, the decision was made, first of all, to create this, as you can see, kind of very um, organic looking architecture. It almost reminds me of uh, some of the great national parks out in Utah. You think of Bryce and some of the other uh, Canyon uh, uh, national parks out in the West, again, especially in Utah. The decision was also made to use a very neutral palette. Um, uh, actually, in my photo here, it, it's a lot whiter in this photograph than it is. It's, it's a little more sandy colored uh, in, when you're in the room personally. Uh, and this is because they wanted to create a space that could be used for many kinds of different gatherings and that um, uh, videos could be projected onto the onto the walls or different colored lights or they could hang from some of the upper balconies they can hang um you know ivy and flowers and things like that so they they tried on the one hand to create something um that resembles a cave or a canyon and on the other hand something that was very utilitarian uh because the museum hosts many many things um, including in that space, can you imagine a wedding and don't think that they aren't being planned. So, as I said, this is a magnificent and open space. Now, there are four floors in this building. First floor, this little opening is the second, this is the third, and way up on top, you see the people there, uh, that is the fourth floor. And up on that fourth floor of the building, is the brand new Gottesman Research Library and Learning Center, which is open to the public's, uh, public Mondays through Thursdays. And there visitors can take advantage of a beautiful reading room, which you see here, um, as well as areas for group study. Um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, uh, but uh, for example, this room where you see two people, uh, that's a special study room um, for groups. And then over here, there are other rooms uh, with individual cubicles for uh, laptops, and you can do your online research. Um, this is a photograph, a uh, different angle of uh, 
of the collection there. Uh, there are over 275,000 books in the collection, some of which, as you can see, are on display on shelves. But all you have to do is go up to a, a librarian or a reference librarian, you know, say, gee, I'm, I'm doing research on, well, let's keep it to today's topic. I'm doing research on butterflies. What do you got for me? And they can help you, uh, you know, and they can bring to you books. It's, uh, it is truly a research library in the sense you sit in a place and they bring the books to you. You don't necessarily scour, uh, scour through bookshelves. Now, one of the other highlights on the first three floors, the Lewis V. Gerstner Corps Collection Corps. And this is one of the highlights of the Gilder Center. Along the walls of the first three floors are seemingly endless display cases that will rotate the nearly 34 million artifacts in the museum's collection. Now, these beautiful collection cases allow the museum to show off artifacts that are not on display in its permanent collection. Um, and each of these walls with the collection, several shelves of collections, um, well over 100 feet long, if not longer, on every floor. Uh, so some of the core uh, displays um, uh, emphasize, for example, prehistoric artifacts, such as here we have ancient relatives of elephants over here. Um, we've got uh, beautiful uh, turtles over here, the prehistoric turtles, etc. So you can study all along and on these wall, blue walls you see where that man is standing where my arrow is um, there are several of these blue walls and they have interactive screens that you can touch so that for example if you want to find out more about the turtle you go over to the interactive wall and press turtles and you could stand there for hours just learning about turtles um other floors uh show artifacts from the museum's anthropology collection. So you see you have some prehistoric here, but now here's their anthropology, uh, some anthropolo uh, anthropological materials. Oh, and here you can see one of those blue screens and you see all these little circles. So all you have to do is just press one of them and it blows up and you get a, a special uh, screen that will tell you about, gee, I wanna find out something about this pottery. Well, you click that on here, you'll find out more. There's also uh, one uh, section uh, on, uh, I believe this is the fourth, excuse me, the first floor. Um, you have, you, you know, everything from insects and birds, uh, a lovely section on butterflies over here. Uh, and again, um, birds. And again, you can go to any one of these larger blue walls and find out more information. And I think this is really cool because Behind that glass, so on either side here, you can see some of those displays. Well, some of the displays are open like this so that you can look back behind the display cases. And what you're gonna see is row upon row upon row upon row of moving shelves, which now, here you can see here, librarians are beginning to stock with those 34 million artifacts, or at least some of them quite something. Now, relevant to today's discussion about insects are two focal points of the new center. On the first floor is the Susan and Peter J. Solomon Family Insectarium, where visitors can discover the wonders of arthropods. And the insect, this was one of my favorite, and seems to be the big, uh, I don't know, the big hit of the insectarium, the insectarium houses a remarkable farm for leaf cutter ants. So here's the leaf cutter ant farm. And the ants leave this nest. They cross a rope bridge near the ceiling and they descend uh, into uh, a, a jungle of plants that are replenished every day or so. And from there, the ants reascend uh, tree-like aluminum pipes 
you can see them here on the aluminum pipe just schlepping along very nicely. And they go back to their colony um, uh, where fungus grows on the decayed leaves and that fungus becomes the food for the colony. So it's a great big circle of life there. Um, and it is, I tell you, it's the big hit of the insectarium. Uh, I mean, people are crowded around watching these little guys uh, here lifting like 100 to 200 times their own weight. It's, it's just, it's mesmerizing, literally. <laughs> Now on the second floor is the marvelous Davis family butterfly vivarium. So the insectarium, well, you get that, right? Insectarium, a vivarium. Well, it's from the Latin word vivo, right? To live, so it's living things. Um, the butterfly vivarium. Now for a number of years, the museum took over the Hall of Pacific Birds located off the second floor Roosevelt Rotunda to house its butterfly conservatory. Well, with the completion of the Gilder Center, the museum can now regain again its wonderful bird hall in the 1935 building and can have this permanent, much larger space for its impressive collection of living butterflies and moths. Um, it's an entomologist's dream and a place of fancy and fantasy for those of us who are mesmerized by the beauty of these remarkable creatures. It's truly a vivarium, a place of life. Now, as I said, the vivarium, it's a word that comes from the Latin word for life, viva, has numerous islands like the kind you're seeing on your screen where the moths and the butterflies can live and eventually reproduce. So we, the viewers, move around these numerous islands to uh, examine and, 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 and kind of live with the, the butterflies, which by the way, just love it. If you hold an orange in your hand, for example, they'll come and they'll feed right off your hand. It, it's quite wonderful. Now the whole vivarium and its various jungle islands are kept at toasty 80 degrees with relatively high humidity to provide a perfect environment for these remarkable animals. And in the upper left over here where my arrow is right now, um, you can see the room that houses the lab for scientists who study moths and butterflies. They're called lepidopterists. It's really quite something. Oh, and by the way, so when you leave the vivarium, you enter almost like a, like a, a lock, an airlock that you go into where you check yourselves and other people and the guards check you to make sure that no butterfly has hitched a ride. And then once everybody is clear, then you are allowed to, to leave. It, it's, uh, it's quite an elaborate process getting in and out of it, but it makes sense. And um, in the core collection, you can study uh, specific species of butterflies and other insects um, as well as arachnids like uh, scorpions and spiders. And we're going to talk about them in a few minutes. So that's kind of a little, you know, uh, my, my 15 minute uh, tour of the Gilder Center with you. Um, so the next time you are in New York, a visit to the Gilder Center at the Museum of Natural History is really a must see. It's quite a dramatic building. Um, and you can find out more about the center once again at my website. Uh, but also, if you go to the museum's website, which is amnh.org, if you go to their website and just type in under search Gilder Center, um, you will be brought to that page. But what we're going to do now is pick up on the theme of the vivarium and the insectarium and explore the remarkable world of arthropods, which means, yep, yeah, we have to do some sciencey stuff first, starting with a few definitions, such as, what the heck is an arthropod? Well, let's watch a short video clip from the Smithsonian Institution that explains what we mean. Uh, the closed captioning is fairly accurate, but you may have to adjust the sound on your devices.
We're in the lab of the Smithsonian's Insect Zoo, but that name is a little wrong because we have a lot more than insects here. Technically, we are an arthropod zoo. So what is an arthropod? It's actually pretty simple. It's a group of animals with specific characteristics. The main one being a jointed leg or foot, and that's where the name arthropod comes from. They also have a hard outer shell or exoskeleton, and they're bilaterally symmetrical which means if you drew an imaginary line down the middle, they'd be virtually identical on both sides. Scientists have divided arthropods into five major groups. Those are the millipede, the centipede, the crustaceans, the arachnids, and of course, the insects. So if we're looking at these five major groups of arthropods, how do we tell which is which? How do they fit in their groups? Well, they each have defining characteristics. Millipedes are a long, thin, slow-moving animal, and they're segmented, and they have four legs for each of those segments. A centipede is a long, thin, predatory animal. They're amazing hunters and very fast. And their main characteristics, they have two legs for each of their body segments. The crustaceans have 10 or more legs in pairs, they have two pairs of antenna, and they have two main body regions, the abdomen and the cephalothorax. Arachnids, the group which includes spiders and scorpions, have eight legs in pairs, no antenna, and one or two body regions. If it's two body regions, they're called the cephalothorax and the abdomen. Insects one of the most diverse group of arthropods can be characterized through its three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They have a pair of antenna. Some have wings. But most importantly, they have six legs in pairs. That's a really cool, very simple, straightforward, you know, that's what an arthropod is. So now that we understand some of the basics, let's let's dig a little further. First and foremost, arthropods are the most successful group of animals on Earth. And they have been around for at least 400 million years. The phylum we call Arthropodia includes more species and more individuals than all other groups of animals combined. And uh, yeah, just to review our high school biology, here's the order of living things on your planet, now, on, on this, our planet, right? Uh, on top, there's life, then there's domain, then there's kingdom, then there's phylum, and under phylum, you have class, order, family, genus, and species. Over 85 to 86% of all known animal species on the planet Earth are arthropods. And they live in the widest range of habitats and eat the greatest variety of food of any other animal on the planet. Now, the chart on your right, um, uh, your screen there, puts all of this in perspective. Only about 14% of animals on Earth, including us, are not arthropods. And of that astonishing number of species, 75% are insects. Now, imagine that. The number of arthropods, ants, flies, mosquitoes, cockroaches, beetles, spiders, etc., vastly exceed the number of vertebrates like humans, dogs, cats, fish, cows, etc. Put another way, vertebrates, animals with a backbone, account for only a fraction of life on our world. Earth is indeed the planet of arthropods and very specifically, the planet of insects. Well, let's zero in a bit. Arthropods, as I say, have been around for at least 400 million years. And that's a typo on my screen. It says 300 uh, uh, million, uh, but it, it's 400 million for arthropod, but yes, 300 million 
uh, for uh, insects. So that part is correct, but I forgot to add the 400 million. So arthropods have been around for 400 million. Insects are arthropods that have been around for 300 million. So they've been around way before even dinosaurs. Now think of that. Before there were any brontosauruses or T-Rexes or duckbill dinosaurs or stegosaurs, giant dragonflies and other kinds of insects were already flitting through Paleozoic forests. Indeed, many insects have changed very little since the days of dinosaurs. With well over one million different kinds, insects have the honor of being the most numerous of all life forms on Earth. And some scientists think one million species is a very conservative estimate. Now, a quick pause here. I know we are uh, we are recording this, so I don't want to take time. Uh, if you have a question to ask during the program and want to put it in the chat, please send it to Marie, please. Do not send it to everyone. One of the problems is that when you send a chat to everyone, it pops up in the middle of my screen and I can't read some of my text. So if you could just send those chat texts, we love the questions, just please send them to Marie, okay? Now, here's a quick review uh, of this before we move on. Here you go. Here's a little quick review, which I think is going to be lots of fun, from the Royal Etymology Department in Great Britain. Etymology Society, I should say. We live in a world of insects. Insects are animals. There are more different types of insect than any other animal on Earth. We call these different types species, and around one million species of insect have been discovered so far, and scientists think there may be up to 10 million species in total. Insects are arthropods, which means they have legs with joints, bodies in segments, and a hard outer covering called an exoskeleton like having your skeleton on the outside, like a suit of armour. Insects have three pairs of legs and a body divided into three sections. A head with eyes, mouth parts and antennae. A thorax containing muscles where the legs and wings are attached. And an abdomen containing stomach and breathing tubes. Insects are invertebrates, animals without a backbone. They are the only invertebrate that can fly. The insect body has allowed them to live in most land habitats around the world. Insects have been around since before the dinosaurs and are still here in huge numbers today. They truly are the little things that run the world. I love that. The little things that run the world. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, right? Anywho, uh, so that's a quick review right, of everything we've done so far. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people mislabel certain animals. So, hmm, what are the animals that are not insects, but that get called insects, often under the umbrella term bugs? Well, as you saw in the first video, uh, millipedes and centipedes are definitely arthropods, but they're not insects. And the most distinguishing factor, their legs. Insects have six legs. Centipedes have many pairs and millipedes have dozens. Centipedes, as we have heard, have one pair per body segment. Millipedes have two pairs per segment. So bottom line, all those legs disqualify them, not insect. Oh yes, and then there are the spiders. At least 45,000 different species are found on every continent except Antarctica. They live in incredibly diverse habitats from deep in caves to an altitude of almost 22,000 feet on Mount Everest where they survive on food that is blown up from the lower elevations. And they live in deserts as hot as Death Valley to tundras 
in the coldest parts of Siberia, but they're not insects. And once again, it's the number of legs that become one of the key factors. Spiders have eight legs, insects have six. Spiders also only have two main body parts, a cephalothorax, which is a combination of the head and the thorax, and the abdomen. Insects, as we've heard, have three main body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. And unlike most insects, spiders can't fly. So once again, spiders are terrific little arthropods, but they're not insects. And if you want to be exact, spiders are arachnids, which is kind of a branch of arthropods. All arachnids have the two body parts, they don't fly, and they have eight legs. But in addition to spiders, the other major arachnid species are the scorpions. Like spiders, they have no wings. They have two main body parts, the cephalothorax and the uh, abdomen with its impressive stinger. And they also possess eight legs including the front pair, which have pincers. So to date, over 2,000 species of scorpions have been identified, including the motley crew that you see on your screen, but none of them qualify as insects. So with all of that out of the way, I'd love to spend time with four different animals that are insects animals that truly make our world what it is. Without ants, without bees, without butterflies and moths, the world as we know it would literally collapse. Ants play a crucial role on our planet. They are populous in number and essential for soil aeration, fertilization, and ecological balance. Ants are also a vital food source for other creatures. The extinction of ants would cause catastrophic damage to our ecosystem. Bees pollinate plants. Without them, the human food chain would collapse. Honeybees alone pollinate 80% of all flowering plants, including more than 130 types of fruits and vegetables. Unfortunately, bee populations have dropped alarmingly across the world, especially in North America, as have the population of many other pollinator species. And as far as butterflies and moths, well, aside being gorgeous to look at, on a practical level, butterflies and moths are the primary food source for some wasps and flies. And further, without these wonderful insects, many plant species would be unable to reproduce and their populations would dramatically decrease. Save a butterfly or a moth, you can save the world. Needless to say, we only have time to explore the basics for each of these groups. Uh, for much more information, once again, please visit my website, makingwings.net, and take deeper dive number 93. So let's start with ants. Ants have some exceptional capabilities, including their legendary communication skills that allow their colonies to function as superorganisms. There are probably, and this is an estimate, 20 quadrillion or more ants on Earth. That's 2.5 million ants for every single human being on the planet. Known ant species, members of the family Formidaceae, Formis a day, uh, number 12,000, and some experts estimate that there's upwards of 20,000 ant species. They can be found almost anywhere in the world with the exception of Antarctica, Iceland, Greenland, and some South Pacific Island nations. It's an interesting little fact. Antarctica, I can buy, but yeah, places like Iceland and Greenland and some islands in the South Pacific, no ants. And ants have been around our planet for at least 100 to 130 million years. In other words, they seem to have evolved in the Cretaceous period and were hobnobbing with T. rex, triceratops, and 
the members of the theropod family that would eventually evolve into today's living dinosaurs, the birds. Now, ants raise, uh, range in size from very small, like black garden ants, like the kind you see uh, in the upper left corner, um, and usually appear black, brown, red, or yellow, and are well under an inch in size. Now, ants do look much like termites, and the two are often confused, but ants can be identified by their uh, elbowed antennae, is there. That's a termite. This is an ant. Uh, they have the elbowed uh, antennae, uh, the narrow waist between the abdomen and thorax, and some ants have wings, uh, which are longer in the front and shorter by the hind legs. The presence of wings indicates an ant's fertility. Ants with wings are either queens or drones, whose job it is to mate with them. Now, enthusiastically social insects, ants typically live in structured nest communities that may be located underground, in ground level mounds, or even in trees. Carpenter ants, for example, which include more than a thousand species, are not to be confused with termites, which are completely separate species. Uh, they nest in wood and can be destructive to buildings. But underground ant colonies can contain hundreds of thousands of individual ants. Communities are headed by a queen or queens. Uh, queens lay thousands of eggs to ensure the survival of the colony. And in some species, male ants, known as drones, often ha have only one role, and that's mating with the queen, and they often die shortly after. Worker ants, the most visible colony members, are all female and they never reproduce, but instead they forage uh, for food. They care for the queen's offspring, they work on the nest, and they protect the community. Some workers can carry 50 times their own body weight. Ants communicate and cooperate by secreting pheromones or scent chemicals that can alert each other to danger or lead them to a promising food source. And as you see here on the screen, uh, they rub a tenai, uh, they click their mandibles, or they bump their heads together, which is, I think, what's going on on our screen here. Ant colonies are so tightly knit and efficient that they can pass useful knowledge between generations, which some experts believe constitutes a kind of a colony memory. Uh, this kind of communal uh, knowledge is essential for defense. So ants can easily differentiate friendly and hostile forces. Uh, once again, I have to ask people, please do not send chat messages to everyone. Please send them directly to Marie. When you send it to everyone, it covers my screen. And sometimes, in some cases, I can't read my own text. So um, if you would please just do me that little favor, send any chat to Marie. Now, earlier in the program, uh, I showed you the leaf cutter ant colony in the insectarium at the Museum of Natural History. Well, courtesy of PBS, here's a cool little video showing you the daily trek of a leaf cutter ant colony out in the wilds of Ecuador. I love this little video. It's just a minute, but it's what a cool minute it is. <laughs>
I just find that so remarkable. I mean, remember for them to consider the size of an aunt. Uh, I mean, that's like walking miles and miles and miles. And as you can see in the picture on your screen, uh, they're lifting pieces of vegetation that often weigh double or more of their weight, sometimes up to 50 times their weight. Well, from ants, we move on to bees. Bees are winged insects closely related to wasps and ants, known for their roles in pollination and in the case of the best known bee species, the Western honeybee, for producing honey. There are over 16,000 known species of bees in seven recognized biological families. Some species, including honeybees, bumblebees, and stingless bees, live socially in large colonies, while most species, including mason bees, carpenter bees, and uh, leafcutter bees, so just like leafcutter ants, there are leafcutter bees, they live in moderately sized nests and often work independently. Like most other insects, uh, bees are found on every uh, continent except Antarctica and every habitat on the planet that contains insect pollinated flowering plants. Bees range in size from tiny stingless bees, uh, like the kind you see on your screen, whose workers are less than eight hundredths of an inch long, imagine that, how tiny that is, to the largest species of leaf cutter ants whose females can attain a length of over one and a half inches. Uh, bees feed on nectar and pollen. Nectar, uh, which is not unlike a tree sap, is primarily an energy source for bees. Pollen is primarily a source for protein and other nutrients. Most pollen is used as food for their larvae. But as the bee moves from plant to plant, they sometimes def uh, they sometimes deposit some of that pollen, which in turn I guess the best word is impregnates that other flower or that other fruit. So that's why pollination is so important. And that brings me to bee pollination is important both ecologically and commercially. And the decline of wild bees has increased the value of pollination by commercially managed hives of honeybees. But the statistics are staggering and the loss could be catastrophic. The map on your screen shows the loss of just the honeybee species in just one year period in the lower 48 states. It's, it's pretty grim. This is one of the most recent. So the colors indicate loss. So in some cases, uh, look at Iowa, 58% fewer bees. Uh, Utah, 51% fewer bees than just recently. So every state in my state of Oregon, 29, uh, over in New York, where you guys are, 39%. So uh, it's quite something. And that is all the more reason for the importance of beekeeping. Human beekeeping or apiculture, um, and it's a, a meliponiculture for stingless bees, has been practiced for millennia since at least the times of ancient Egypt and Greece. Beekeeping has appeared in mythology and folklore through all phases of art and literature from ancient times to the present, as seen in this illustration from a medieval European manuscript. Apiculture is more common in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and in Mesoamerica, the Mayans have actually practiced large scale uh, intensive meliponiculture, non stinging bees since at least pre-Columbian times. Now, I'd like to give a brief look at bees with a short video from the National Geographic. It's about honeybees and truly gives you a respect for the complexity of bee life. The honeybee is one of the most collaborative insects in the world. Each hive is comprised of thousands of bees working together in order to build and sustain a colony. Within the colony, each bee has a specific role to play, a job, if you will. 
These are jobs like foraging for food, tending to young larvae, and building a honeycomb. But with a brain about the size of a sesame seed, it begs the question, how do bees know what specific job they need to do in order to keep balance in the hive? The answer is written into the genetic makeup of each bee. And it starts with the queen bee, who has the unique ability to designate the sex of her children, which plays a pivotal role in their future. If the queen wants to lay a female egg, she will fertilize the egg by releasing spermatozoa that is stored in the spermatheca, which sits behind her ovaries. The spermatheca is filled during her first week of life, when she mates with up to 20 drones, or male bees. If the queen wants to lay a male egg, she will not release any spermatozoa as the egg leaves the ovaries. And drones have a singular job. That job is to mate with queens from other colonies to propagate the species. When they're not trying to mate, they eat leisurely from the honey reserves and wait for a queen to go on her nuptial flight. Female bees, or worker bees, do literally everything else. They keep the cells clean, care for the larvae, build cells, tend to the queen, store honey, forage, pollinate, guard the nest, and even feed male bees honey if they're begging for it. Each bee knows what to do because their hormones activate the part of their genetic makeup that tells them what jobs they have to tackle and when they have to tackle them. They go through four phases of jobs before dying. In phase one, bees go to work immediately after they emerge from metamorphosis, about three weeks after they're born. They begin cleaning the cells from which they emerged. After about three days, their hormones shift them into nurse bee mode. In this job, they feed the young brood that succeeds them. This lasts for about a week. Then phase three kicks in, and the workers become general handymen, moving farther away from the center of the hive and doing things like building honeycomb, storing food, and guarding the nest entrances. This lasts about a week. The final phase is the most dangerous. It's the foraging phase, where workers leave the nest to find pollen to bring home and feed the colony. This phase starts around day 41 and lasts until about day 50. After a short life of constant work, most workers will leave the nest as death approaches. The corpses of those that die inside the hive are carried out by undertaker bees. It's a thankless life for the worker bee, but this collaboration and process has made them one of the most successful superorganisms in nature. So that is a really cool thing. And you know, you heard in this video, the same thing you heard um, about ants, and that is that the workers, which do the majority of the work, both in bees and in ants, are female. Well, next up are the butterflies and moths, and we're gonna start with butterflies. If you were to go to the Smithsonian Institution website, you'd be given eight key facts about butterflies. So why don't we use those main points to look at these extraordinary creatures? Uh, due to their bright colors and their visits to flowers, butterflies are probably the most familiar of all insects to humans. There are at least 17,500 species of butterflies in the world with around 750 species in the United States alone. As is the case with all insects, the exact number of species is hard to determine. Indeed, scientists are uncovering new varieties every year, especially in the more remote regions of our planet. Now, here's a fascinating characteristic of butterflies, as well as their moth cousins. Butterflies and moths are the only group of insects that have scales covering their wings. And you can see this clearly in the photographs on your screen, those are scales. Another interesting characteristic of butterflies that makes them different from other insects uh, is their ability to coil their proboscis or their feeding tube. And it gets retracted into this little spiral. Caterpillars are the names given to the larvae of both butterflies and moths. They are usually very distinctive and in some cases may be identified more easily than the adult versions. When they are developing, their skin may be shed four or more times with each molt, often changing the coloration and appearance of the caterpillar. 
They eat voraciously to transform plant material into tissues that they will need for their metamorphosis into butterflies. Caterpillars, with few exceptions, eat plants and therefore may be considered harmful to the plants. But however, butterflies are very important to many plants, including the ones that caterpillars eat. They are dependent upon flower visiting insects for cross pollination. Interestingly, most female butterflies will deposit their eggs on a variety of plant that they know that their caterpillars will eat, thus ensuring the nutrition for their offspring. Once a butterfly, adults usually feed on nectar from the flowers of plants, although many butterflies, especially in the tropics, will also feed on rotting fruit or even dung, for example. Butterflies migrate, often in the hundreds of millions, and is best exemplified by the monarch butterfly, which is widely known to, mon uh, to migrate in fall to overwintering sites in California and Mexico. But in the United States, several other butterfly species engage in lesser migration distances. Some of these are uh, the buckeye, the painted lady, and the purple wing, among others. By the way, wing colors in butterflies arise due to the nature of the scales they produce on their wings and can uh, be due to pigmentation as well as structural color. Extremely thin multi-layer structures in their wing scales often produce a colorful iridescence from reflected sunlight. Because of optical phenomena, changes in the angle of light and the viewing angle of the observer, you and me, result in shifts in the color of butterfly wings. This rich shimmering color of some butterfly wings are produced not by pigments, but by special uh, geometric formations of cells within those scales called gyroids. And they diffract sunlight and just in the same way that crystal do. So like when you shine sunlight through a crystal, it makes a rainbow on your, the wall or whatever you're, whatever you're using as a screen. Well, same thing with, this is what gyroids do on butterfly wings. And what about butterfly vision? Well, like all arthropods, butterflies have compound eyes. Now the photo on your screen gives you a sense of how a butterfly would see a group of flowers in a garden. Here's a diagram of a butterfly eye. It's a complex system that allows an arthropod to see things in different ways, in ways that a human can't. For example, the different colors and patterns that butterflies can see are invisible to the human eye. Indeed, some of them can actually see infrared colors. This is because their eyes can distinguish between ultraviolet, infrared, and polarized light, something we humans, our human eyes can't do. Bottom line, the vision of butterflies is excellent and they're able to fly with precision in areas filled with obstacles. Here's a great shot of uh, a butterfly. Uh, you not only see its large eyes, but you also see that coiled proboscis which will uncoil when it feeds on a flower. Now, as far as mating is concerned, we have a little x-ray photograph uh, here on your screen. Ooh, ooh. Hope, hope we're not banned. <laughs> uh, females are usually able to engage in mating on the day of their emergence, but males do not normally mate for several days. Courtship rituals vary widely among species. Butterflies, like many species of animals, are sexually dimorphic, meaning that males and females are different in appearance. Now, these differences can range from the size of the butterfly to its colors and to its markings, which is known as dichromaticism. Quite often, females are less colorful, but larger than males. However, this varies by species. So for example, the male monarch is larger than the female monarch. So the male's on top, the female's on the bottom there. And 
you can see that the male is slightly larger. You can also see that its coloring is slightly more bold than that of the female. The choice of a mate often lies with the female and they choose based on brightness and boldness of color. But many scientists believe that females are less colorful because they carry the eggs. And so their color needs to be less attractive to predators. Well, what I'd like to show you is this wonderful video from an online British educational site called Science Resources. While this video is geared for younger viewers, I think it makes the whole process crystal clear for us adults too. So enjoy. Butterflies. They are some of the most magical insects you can see in the environment. Their wings look like beautiful artworks. And they come in all the colours of the rainbow. But did you know that the beautiful butterflies you see actually used to be caterpillars? Now you might be wondering, how did they change from a tiny, wriggly, worm-looking insect to a stunning butterfly? Well, you're about to find out. The life cycle of a butterfly has four stages. It all begins when a female butterfly lays her eggs. Inside these eggs, caterpillars begin to grow. Once an egg is ready, it hatches and out comes a larva, also known as a caterpillar. The caterpillar leaves its egg behind, finds a leaf and starts eating and eating and eating. You might have seen a caterpillar in a garden munching away. As a caterpillar grows, its skin becomes too tight for its growing body. The caterpillar sheds this old skin because underneath there is a new, bigger skin, which is much more comfortable. This process of shedding skin is called molting. Now it's time for the caterpillar to begin changing into a pupa. The pupa stage is pretty uneventful because all they really do is hang upside down in a cocoon. A cocoon is also called a chrysalis. The pupa needs to stay really still so predators don't spot it wriggling around and eat it for dinner. This is the stage where the caterpillar begins to grow its wings. The last stage is when the adult butterfly breaks free. It slowly comes out of its cocoon and spreads its beautiful wings, getting ready to take flight. Once it's ready, it will fly off and eventually lay its own eggs, starting the cycle all over again. As you can see, the caterpillar goes through a number of changes before it reaches the final stage of being a butterfly. This spectacular physical transformation is called metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is said to have occurred when an animal transforms from its young form into its adult form. The frog also goes through metamorphosis. It transforms from an egg to a tadpole, then slowly grows arms and legs and transforms into an adult frog. Can you think of any other animals or insects that go through special stages to grow into an adult? What about you? Have you gone through some physical changes since you were born? video and you know I just always marvel at 
the complexity of that life form. Well, before we move on, let's just say a few words about the cousins of butterflies, the moths. According to uh, the Museum of Natural History and to the Smithsonian Institute and the Field Museum in Chicago, there are at least 160,000 or more species of moths in the world compared to only 17,500 of butterflies. In the United States alone, there are nearly 11,000 species of moths. Current research suggests that they shared uh, a common ancestor back in the day. Uh, that the common ancestor of butterflies and moths likely appeared about 300 million years ago, roughly 100 million years earlier than previous estimates. That's the, the latest uh, science on this, that butterflies and moths have been around for 300 million years. We also believe that butterfly ancestors were moths. Scientists believe that around 60 million years ago, when bats became to, uh, to began to dominate the night sky, some moths became day flying to escape these predators, thus giving rise to butterflies. But there are other distinctions that make both moths and butterflies quite special. Now, here's a terrific little video produced by the Peggy Notbert Natural, excuse me, Nature Museum, uh, which uh, is a natural history museum located in Chicago, Illinois, and is operated by the Chicago Academy of Sciences. If you're ever traveling through the area, uh, this museum, the Peggy Notbert Nature Museum, is a wonderful place to visit. Have you ever wondered what the differences are between butterflies and moths? They both comprise a group of insects called Lepidoptera. Lepido means scaly, and terra means wing. So they're literally named the scaly winged insects. If you were to draw a family tree of every scaly winged insect in the world, one branch would include all of the butterflies, while the rest of the tree would include moths. If we look closely, it's easy to see how they got the name Lepidoptera. The wings of both moths and butterflies are covered with colorful tiny scales. It's the arrangement of these scales that gives them their elaborate patterns. Both butterflies and moths go through four basic life stages. Egg, larva or caterpillar, pupa, and adult. When they reach the pupa stage, they deal with it in different ways. Butterfly caterpillars become chrysalises. The pupa's body is hard to help protect it from predators, but the caterpillar doesn't make any additional covering. Moth caterpillars, on the other hand, create a covering known as a cocoon out of silk that then surrounds the pupa for additional protection. Can you see the differences between them? Let's take a closer look at their bodies. In addition to four scaly wings, moths and butterflies have six legs and two large compound eyes. Most butterflies and moths have a long straw-like mouth part called a proboscis, but some moths don't have mouth parts at all. The moths in the royal silk moth family, like the atlas moth, actually do all of their eating as caterpillars, and then live off of those nutrients through their short adult life. All insects have a pair of antennae attached to their heads. They're sensory organs that help the insects observe their surroundings. Insects can use their antennae to smell, taste, touch, and sense vibrations. They come in all shapes and sizes depending on the kind of insect. Antennae are actually the best way to tell butterflies and moths apart. Almost all butterflies have what are called clubbed antennae. Their antennae are long and thin, and then thicken into a club shape towards the end. Moths, meanwhile, have many different kinds of antennae. They can be thick, thin, or even feathery, but they're never clubbed. There are always exceptions to the rule, but there are a couple of other clues you can use to help tell moths and butterflies apart. Moths are primarily nocturnal, which means they're active at night. Butterflies are primarily diurnal, which means they're active during the day. While at rest, butterflies often close and hold their wings above their bodies. Moths, on the other hand, often open and allow their wings to cover their bodies. The next time you walk through the park, your backyard, 
or the Judea Stock Butterfly Haven, test your identification skills and see if you can tell the difference between these beautiful high-flying insects. And that nature garden that was referred to uh, in that little video is part of uh, the uh, nature museum, the Peggy Notebird Nature Museum in Chicago. So let's just do this. Okay. Well, there you have three of the more remarkable insect families. The Formicidae, or ants, the Apidae, or bees, and the Lepidoptera, or butterflies and moths. But I can't resist giving, to close out this presentation, a little shout out to some other special insects that bring delight and wonder to this world. The dragonfly, an insect whose ancestors were flying around Earth's jungles nearly 320 million years ago, long before the dinosaurs. In fact, an early model of dragonfly called Meganeura moni is presumed to be the largest insect ever with a wingspan between 27 and 30 inches long. Ah, the praying mantis, oh, it's a favorite of gardeners. And it's become the subject of an enduring myth, namely that killing a praying mantis is illegal and that this species is endangered. Well, these notions were first circulated in America during the 1950s. Interestingly, there has never been a state or federal law on the books that prohibited killing a praying mantis. However, they do serve a good role in the ecosystem because they eat many bugs that would traditionally be considered pests. It's believed that the rumor might have been started to prevent homeowners from needlessly killing these creatures who can help to reduce the number of less pleasant bugs. Many gardeners wish uh, that they had more praying mantises in their yard to uh, decrease the need for pesticides uh, and uh, help their crops to survive, uh, to thrive, I should say, as a result. So while it's not officially illegal to kill a praying mantis, that doesn't mean you should ever do so if you spot one in your yard. Instead, enjoy one of nature's most magnificent and unique creature um, and take a picture like this magnificent orchid praying mantis. And then of course, there are beetles. And once again, I have to please Thank you very much uh, for, for making comments, but please send comments to Marie and not to the general because it covers my screen. Thank you. Okay, where was I? Uh, and then of course, there are the beetles, not the group. <laughs> Researchers estimate that beetles evolved around 327 million years ago. Today, there are some 350,000 described species worldwide. And in the United States alone, there are nearly 30,000 kinds of beetles. Well, for those of us interested in ancient Egypt, uh, we know the, scare, the sacred uh, and sometimes cursed scarab beetles. And of great benefit to many environments is the ever industrious dung beetle. Of course, there's everyone's favorite beetle, commonly called a ladybug, that remains a never-ending joy for children of all ages. I love those photographs. Well, crickets and grasshoppers provide the soundtrack for summers in many places in the world. And while it's true that their cousins, the locusts, can be a plague, the majority of grasshopper and cricket species are actually beneficial to the environment. Besides, one famous critic taught us great lessons about keeping hope, listening to our conscience, and yes, wishing upon a star. Of course, we all know the common house fly. Some of us hate them. Some of us find them fascinating. Some of us buy fly swatters. And some of us try a million ways to keep them from our picnic lunches. Bottom line, houseflies, known to the scientific community as Musca domestica, originated in the Middle East and have been around for at least 65 million years. 
So they've been squatting. Well, I guess they have squatting rights uh, because hominins have only been around for about 8 million years. So uh, houseflies win. But let's end with this, a magical experience. Lightning bugs, also known as fireflies, which are members of the beetle family. Here's a short National Geographic video that focuses on a firefly species that lives in America's Great Smoky Mountains. The synchronous firefly ranges throughout the Southern Appalachians. It really is a pretty magical thing to see. I think people are just fascinated by fireflies, you know, especially growing up. Um, a lot of people have experiences of catching fireflies in jars and looking at how they're doing their flashing, you know, looking at them real close. Maybe it reminds them of their youth and they want to bring their children out to experience the same thing. The synchronous firefly can be distinguished from other species by its pattern of six flashes about half a second apart. It may look somewhat random at first, but when you get a high density of males flashing, the synchronicity of the dark period is, is very obvious, and then the flashing itself will become synchronous as the night goes on. Generally, fireflies do have a similar appearance. Uh, some are larger. The predatory ones tend to be a little bit bigger. And there's a really small species, too, called the, the blue ghost, and it's very small. Um, but generally, they're, they're a type of beetle, and so they're going to have uh, this hard outer shell over their wings that they used to fly with. Um, and they usually also have a little bit of red and yellow markings uh, right above their head. And so uh, you really do have to look at the flash pattern and some other morphological characters to tell the species apart. Generally, the habitat where we find Photinus carolinus is in these low-lying, moist areas where there's kind of a relatively clear understory so that the fireflies can visually see each other. It also has to have somewhat of a closed canopy so that it can be nice and dark. Um, they typically start flashing around 9.30 or 10, but they do wait for it to get fairly dark. There is a, a couple of theories as to why they're synchronous, and the female really does need a large light input in order for her to respond. That's how she recognizes the correct species. Uh, so when she responds and the males then know that she's the right female, then they can reproduce. There's lots of other things that are flashing. So they have to have this sort of Morse code in order to be able to know they're with the right species. Very, very cool. I remember as a kid, my grandparents uh, lived out uh, in Babylon on Long Island uh, back in the 50s when it was still kind of wild land out there in forests and wasn't so developed. And my grandfather and I would go out uh, on a summer's evening and we'd collect fireflies. Uh, so that video brings back great memories. Well, uh, there you have it. It's a whirlwind tour through the Gilder Center at the American Museum of Natural History and a more detailed focus on four of just four of the millions of incredible species of insects that exist on our planet. And remember, for much more information, you can visit my website, makingwings.net, and take a deeper dive at number 93. And with all of that said, I hope you all feel smarter now, <laughs> um, it's time for your thoughts and ideas. And I know that um, Marie, that there were some uh, things that uh, came up on the chat. Um, 